big four, uh, we're trying to cover enfiltration. I would say there are two types of heat loss in a house. And I'll write them down again, please do not forget. Heat loss. Two things. Transmission is when heat goes through a medium. Mostly we are concerned with walls, doors, windows, ceiling, and floor. And filtration is about air leaks. So how much do we exchange the air inside a room or a house per hour? And I will show you how is that calculated. Uh, how do we test? For air, uh, for air leaks, how do we know this room has air leaks? We don't know. If there's no window outside, huh? Infrared camera. Infrared camera is one way. Smoke. See where the air leaks. Smoke. smoke. But again, with the smoke, you need uh, to pressurize the house. If there is no pressure, you'll never see the air migrate. Make sense? No. So in a windy day, probably it's a big day to see where the air leaks are. And you can do the blower door testing. Uh, I'll show a video on how it's done. And basically it's a door that you put into your front door, you seal everything, you close everything, and you turn it on, it's a big fan. And it will negative pressure your your house. I would say it's like a, some equipment in the house require you to have some uh, uh, venting, like dryer, exhaust fans, chimneys, a make of air, those are all opening in your house that they are supported <coughs> and designed to bring in air into your house. So blower door, door testing is the most common one if you work for Eversource or Columbia Gas or any power company, they will send you somebody, they schedule an appointment and they will send you somebody to do a blower door testing. It's for free. And uh, why? Because at least 50% of the heat loss in the house is done because of uh, air exchange. You'll be pumping heat to your house but your air is coming, is leaking to the outside all the time. It's the most practical way to predict the air leakage and they give you the air leakage as cubic feet per minute, CFM. CFM is the most common unit to use to measure airflow. So if you look at the duct, duct work, it's always measuring CFM. Vents, they're always measuring CFM. If you buy any fan or vent fan, they give you how much CFM, how much volume of air it moves uh, per minute. So this is the standard, and we said that we need 50 CFM per minute in residential. If it's an office or a workplace, probably it's more than that. It's 20. In a gym, probably it's up to 35 feet per minute. Otherwise, the air quality will deteriorate and uh, it's not going to feel all right in there. And we said the air is 20% oxygen. And when we breathe, we do not consume all the 20%. That depends on your lungs function and how athletic you are. Uh, athletes probably have bigger lungs and they can consume, uh, uh, they are more efficient in, in uh, uh, absorbing the oxygen. That's why well-trained athletes probably have a heart rate of 50 beats per minute. For us, if average person has between 80 and 90 beats per minute resting. So if you are trained athletes, what does that mean? Your body is more efficient in absorbing oxygen. If you smoke probably, or you exposed to a lot of smoke, or dust from your lungs, they don't have enough absorption of oxygen. So the point being, if you're in a place where you're doing a lot of activities, you're walking a lot, you're working a lot, you need to absorb oxygen more, mean, meaning that you need to introduce more air into the uh, place. In this, you have uh, to pro provide mechanical ventilation. In uh, well-designed gyms or workplaces, they have oxygen sensors that tell you how much oxygen is in the air. And uh, of course, depending on the air quality outside, probably you have less or more oxygen, <coughs> and sometimes more pollens and pollutants. If you look at the weather app in your phone, probably if you scroll up down at the, at the bottom, they will give you something about uh, pollen. There's a pollen index and how much things are suspended in the air. So, the, the point that I'm trying to make is you do not want to bring in just fresh air sometimes, you want to filter that air. Especially if you're in a place where you're doing a lot of activities. Otherwise
otherwise your performance will uh, will change. And OSHA, they have uh, limits and they have regulations depending on how much air and fresh air you bring into your house. What would you think also that you need to bring fresh air more, uh, that, that is more regulated and more uh, sterilized? Hospitals. Hospitals ventilation is completely different. You cannot uh, have one intake for the entire hospital. They have sections. If somebody has an airborne virus or disease, you cannot take that into the main manifold and spread it all over the hospital. So you want to think about that. And they have their own like ventilation system. Sometimes each room has its own vent and its own uh, filters. Uh, there are some filters you can install into intakes that have UV. Some have ozone gas. There are some hardcore filters that will uh, eliminate a lot of these uh, pollutants. There's a procedure in the book for floor and door testing, but I'll show you a video. I'm sure there's a lot of videos online you can watch about this, but uh, this is one quick one I found, just so you have an idea of what it looks like. It's an easy thing to do. You can uh, rent the fan, or you can buy it basically a fabric that you put on the front door or something that goes outside and you depressurize the house. The smoker is basically a small tube of heater, which you put some same stuff you put in the air. <laughs> Thank you, thank you. 
So where to find the leaks? There are some common areas. After a while, you'll start to practice and know where they take place. Usually between cracks, connection between walls, and sometimes you can't even like uh, know these areas unless you go with a small test. Small test is very practical for many things, especially when you go through a duct board. Sometimes the duct is lodged, and you will never notice it. But if you do, if you pressure the duct, you can uh, run smoke through it and see where there's a crack. And the light doesn't help a lot too. There's also some kind of dye smoke where you fill a chimney or a duct work with some dye and you see where this leak over time. So this is uh, uh, another way to know where the leaks are. So and uh, the infrared camera is a very good way to do it. Same video. So there are two, uh, two ways. The, the infrared camera will just show you where are you losing heat. The blower door test can also tell you where you have uh, infiltration. So losing heat with, when you find heat loss areas in a, in a, in a house using an infrared camera, you're not really sure, right? is it like conduction, is it transmission, or is it infiltration? Uh, this, these tests are more involved than the lower door testing, which they actually they fill your house. Of course, you have to leave, you can't be there. But they fill the house with either sulfur, hexafluoride. It's not toxic, carbon dioxide. It's not toxic, but it can suffocate you, so you have to leave. And uh, they measure the particle per million over time, and they tell you this how much you lose. Again, it's uh, it's uh, it's very accurate, but it takes time and it's very involved. I haven't seen a lot of people doing it in residential, mostly for industrial. But for residential, we're gonna go with the CFM. And the problem with the CFM is it will give you the CFM, CFM for the entire house. So you have to go room by room and see what you have leaked and how much every room will leak. For our intended and, intended and uh, purposes, we do not need to know uh, accurately all these kind of uh, leaks, especially for a room. When we do infiltration for each room, we're just gonna go with the general rule and calculate wall and number of openings. I'll show you how we've that done. This is the scanner. It's a very useful tool to have if you're going to work in heating and cooling because it will show you where you have hot and cold areas. And you can see how this is useful if you want, if you have a lot of duct work near the air handling unit. You can go with a camera and just look at the hot and cold spots. Because again, sometimes it's uh, something you cannot see. It's near the wall, so you cannot see where the air is leaking. But this will show you the hot and cold spots. It's very valuable when it comes to duct work. At least 30% of your cooling and heating is caved through the duct work. Uh, even if it's done properly, sometimes things get lodged out, sometimes the insulation gets worn out. So it's good to know where the duct is leaking. And it's one of the ways to, to know where the leaks are. And uh, you can also use a smoke test to know if it's leaking or not or finding the hot and cold spot. So if you look at the top, it's the attic area where you all the heat will escape. And these areas are very well insulated. Windows, this area is also really thorough. Nobody actually pay attention to. It's the top between the wall and the ceiling. Uh, windows, of course, are a big issue. And they need the window. So if, if we were like to examine this more, mostly through every opening, we have a lot of heat loss. Uh, this heat here could be either infiltration, could be just transmission. Infiltration will be through the cracks, so you can seal the cracks and look again. And it, of course, it will run much better in a cold day when you get the house and go outside and look to see where we're losing heat. Uh, duct testing, you can do smoke test for the duct. You fill the duct with smoke, and you also remember, it's not enough to fill it with smoke, you have to pressurize it. Otherwise, there's no migration. What are the two requirements for air migration? An opening and different pressure. <coughs> no difference in pressure, no air migration. Uh, duct blower, and we can, we can also use a manometer. What does a manometer do? So we talked about that last class. A manometer measures the pressure. 
So if you measure the pressure at one point, then you go to the other point and you measure the pressure. <coughs> There's a big pressure drop. What is that? <coughs> There's a leak. There's a leak somewhere. The pressure gotta go somewhere. There's a leak. There's an obstruction. Sometimes uh, the duct gets bent or crimped at some point and it's not flowing very well. So it could, might not be a leak. Maybe some, there is an obstruction in the, in the middle. Maybe one of the, uh, what are those called? Reducer? Or uh, it's closed? Uh, huh? Damper, thank you. One of the dampers are closed or partially closed or stuck, so you wanna check that with the manometer. Stopping leaks, very simple. Caulking, make sure when you use caulking that it is the right appropriate material, especially if it's external, because it's going to be exposed to moisture and also UV. So get something that's ultraviolet resistance, otherwise it will have to replace it every season. Uh, also think of the temperature. Uh, now, if, if you go to Home Depot, you'll find uh, coping with different temperatures, uh, limitations. There's some looking up to 100, 200, and some of them are to be left only at room temperature. So that's something you have to think about. Here's adhesives. There's plenty of tapes, duct tapes, roller tape, whatever tape you have to secure an area. Again, with tape, you have to think about the temperature and the location. Some tapes are completely not resistant to UV. You put the tape outside, within a week or two is crispy and cooked. Uh, some tapes are also reflective. Mostly some duct tapes, the aluminum tape is reflective and that, uh, the purpose of that is to reflect heat. And it's used a lot with uh, insulation. Gaskets are very, very useful. But between ducts, it's really useful to put a gasket because that will provide a better seal. A gasket is better than putting tape on the outside. Again, that depends on the pressure as well. If you have low pressure, sometimes you can get away with just putting tape. But if it's high pressure, especially near the air handling unit, you'll need to put a proper gasket, otherwise it's not going to work. They have uh, also, uh, you can make your own gasket using paste sometimes, of course. Oh, what's a gasket? Uh, a gasket is a piece of rubber or filament that goes between two pipes, so if I have a pipe here, Another pipe over here, same one. Gasket will go in between. It's going to be a piece of rubber. Right, right. It doesn't have to be rubber. It could be rubber, it could be anything. But just, Black. yeah. It gives some flexibility and it provides sealing. For, uh, did I answer your question? Yes. So for things with really high pressure, you need to have the proper gasket. We, we're going to use gaskets for uh, refrigerant, for uh, diesel, for uh, air, and uh, probably look will know that some gaskets that are meant to be pressed only once. <laughs> so, as a mechanic, usually they yeah, they know that you put the gasket once, you press it. Once you press it, it's done. If you take it out, you have to change the gasket. Why is that? It changes its property and it will leak again. And uh, in our field, probably you're gonna have to do that with the pressure and oil, because they're under a lot of pressure. And that's mainly for gaskets made out of uh, soft metals. Uh, some gaskets, they can be pressed more than once, but rubber gaskets, filament, or whatever. Uh, tapes, plenty of uh, tapes. And again, tapes could be, a, could be a problem if it's not heat resistant, because if you run a furnace and you have hot air duct, and air is going through it. If it's, uh, the air can be at two, uh, as hot as 180 degrees Fahrenheit. So if that tape is, uh, has some glue that is combustible, you might dry it out and it might, be, it might be a problem for you to have that in there because it might catch in fire. And uh, also think, something you want to be aware of is when you have a lot of duct work in the house and it has hot air, make sure there's no combustible material around it in case for some, it does happen. You have some kind of combustible insulation, some paper insulation, and over time, it will dry out and it might catch a fire. Liquid foam is uh, it's easy to use, it's inexpensive. However, it gets messy and it loses property over time. 
And uh, it's really hard to manage sometimes. You spray it, it goes its own way, then you go back and reshape it, and it's really hard to get out of your fingers. But uh, it's very good in some appropriate areas. For example, if you want to fill a cavity, that's very convenient to fill a cavity that's already been made. And I'll show you in the installation chapter how we fill walls with it. You can fill a wall that has really good, uh, I mean, big cavity, it's ha there's no access, so we can drill a hole in the wall, another hole, and just fill the whole thing with foam. It's practical for some things, but not a lot. You see it a lot between like uh, vents and ducts to the outside, and they fill the whole thing with foam. I personally do not think that's a good idea. It doesn't look good, it doesn't seem practical, and it does not provide enough support for the pipe. After a while, the pipe will shake, the, the foam will deteriorate, it becomes into pieces, and uh, it lost its purpose. And if you walk through the shower, you'll see that all over the place. It's not a good idea to do it. The proper way to provide the eye support, cut a piece of uh, uh, aluminum or sheet metal and put it in place properly. Uh, blow in insulation, the same as foam. I'm not gonna know. Blow in insulation is basically cellulose. It's uh, all the newspapers and cardboard that has been treated to be water retarded and uh, flame retarded. So it's treated, it comes as uh, kind of a fuzz. And you, you, yeah, you blow it down, it's uh, inexpensive, however, it does not have very good longevity, especially if you are in a humid area. Eventually it will soak up the moisture and lose its insulating properties. Uh, two more videos about uh, stopping leaks, I'm not gonna go into it too much, but you can watch it on your own which they talk about how to use caulk, how to use tapes, and how to stop leaks in some areas. Okay. This, I'll explain this a little bit, then we'll do a couple of problems on Friday. So we did the, a lot of equations on transmission, and we said Q equal area times Q times delta T. So for here we have the same thing. I'm gonna call this QT, Q uh, transmission, this is QI. What is uh, DT? We know that, right? V is the volume of the room. And N is the exchange rate. So let's just imagine what's happening here. The point, one eight, it's a number that's never, never, never going to change. That's the property of air, how much the air hold heat, okay? The volume is the volume of the room, length, width, and height. The air number is how many times are we going to change the entire volume of air inside the room with the outside? But let's say we have plenty of holes in this room that in every hour the entire volume of this uh, <coughs> of the air in this room will be changed in an hour. So one time, two times, three times, and so on. So this is the infiltration, heat loss, the value of air heat capacity is Vq, Vq per degrees Fahrenheit. The number of uh, changes per hour, infiltration rate, could be half, could be 0.2, could be three times an hour, which is a lot. So it means that every hour has to pump in more heat to heat that. Yeah. And again, that's the <coughs> temperature difference between the inside and outside. You're going to lose air, uh, air at 75 degrees, and you'll bring air at 20 degrees. So we have a temperature exchange. Uh, confusing? Does it make sense? We're talking about air exchange. How many times we change this air? How big is this house? What is the temperature difference? This is how we do infiltration. For our, for our calculation for the heat loss, if you look at the sheet here, this is the first part. I know you can't see, but it says infiltration here. And it asks about the volume, length, width, and height. Factor, where do I get the factor? From the book. 22 book, to give you the factor, and degrees temperature difference, and that will be it. And the factor, 
there's a table in the book and page uh, page 71 if we look at that they try to make it very simple and they give the number changes per, per, per hour with this uh, exploitation factor divided so let's look at those three tables three sections of the table they are the same however each one of them have different Characteristics: Windows and doors not weather strips and no storm sash. You're gonna use this table. Windows and doors are weather strips or with storm sash. You're gonna use this one. This is a very porous wall. So if you go to an old house, you're gonna use this as the, the maximum factor. It's super high. Yeah. When you said um the for the, the volume, yeah. Let me wait. Is that the volume of the house or the room? House, if you're doing for the entire house, you use the house. If you're doing for room by room, you're going to do room right. by room. So for here, we're going to do room by room. If you look at this, it says room. Take it the volume of the room, the factor, based on this table, and degree temperature difference. And that's it. For each room, you add it up together, and you get your infiltration heat loss. The risk is that heat loss transition from the ceiling, transition from the floor, and doors and windows, I will do this as we go on. Okay. I'll do a couple of examples on Friday. This is one of them. So I'm not going to do it now. I'll do it on Friday. Uh, so I'll stop now. Thank you.